Uh, there's a local tennis club uh, that I belong to that holds the final matches of its uh, tournaments uh, every year on Labor Day weekend, men's and women's singles and doubles. And, and for a number of years, uh, I never get into the finals, so this is not a problem. I, they asked me uh, to umpire one of the matches. They have uh, people to, to do that. It's a competitive group, but they're friendly, and the players call their own lines during the finals. Even. <clears throat> and there's little an umpire has to do but uh, keep the score and announce it as the match progresses. But every now and then, the players have a disagreement, and they appeal to the umpire in that case, who has to make a ruling. So when you're an umpire, you do have to pay attention to every shot, because you never know what's going to happen. This year, at the match I called, uh, someone was taking pictures of the players, and the next day I received by email a picture that he had taken of me, sitting in the umpire's chair, which if you've ever seen an umpire's chair, it's raised high above so you have a better view of the court. It's a lofty judgment seat, about five feet up. Uh, in this picture, I got a clipboard in my left hand with a scorecard. I got a pencil in my right hand waiting to record the point. I'm looking off to my right with narrowed eyes and with my lips pressed firmly together. I'm concentrating hard. And folks, I look seriously stern. Uh, I forwarded that picture to my kids and said, does this look familiar? And when I saw that picture, my instant thought was, this is the image that a lot of people have of a priest. Just waiting to mark somebody down. It's a priest's main function. And then I thought, not just of a priest, of course it's the image that some people have of God. A stern lawgiver whose job it is to find out who's naughty and who's nice and then pronounce sentence. I think that opinion is mostly held by people who don't go to church, or at least a healthy church. It's probably the main reason they don't go to church, because they think that's the God they're going to be presented with there. And they just know instinctively that that's not the truth, and they're right, of course. Now, such people might not identify this as God they're thinking about. They have too many preconceptions about that word. They're not comfortable with that language. They might think of it more hazily as the way the world works or what's important in life. But when you take such notions and trace them back to their source, it's God that you end up with, always. And this is not just an academic concern. However we put it into words, what we think about God, how we think of God, is the ground of who we are and what we do and how we behave day in and day out. It's why St. Francis is said to have prayed at the beginning of every day, who am I, Lord, and who are you? He was being intentional about this. It. It's the kind of thing a healthy church does. So it's especially appropriate in this church on this day that we call Start Up Sunday, when we begin a new season, in our lives together as people of faith, that we give this our attention. And by the grace of God, the subject of who God is, how we think about God, and why that's important for our lives, is central to a couple of the readings that we heard today. In the passage from the Gospel of Luke, the false God, the, the one with the clipboard and pencil, who pronounces a sentence, that's the God of the Pharisees and the scribes. That idea of God is the reason that they grumble at Jesus for hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And grumbling is always a red flag in the Bible, as it should be in life. There's always something that grumblers just don't get. For the Pharisees, of course, it's the rules that are important. And the rules say that to associate with sinners is to stain yourself in God's eyes. So this God, the God of the Pharisees, doesn't really get involved except to provide us with a rule book. This is a God who is remote. This God's power is great, but it's an oppressive power. The Pharisees relate to this God principally by means of the satisfaction of what they have decided are God's demands. So it's not about receiving God's love. That's not, not the relationship. It's about earning God's approval. It's a transactional thing. It's also a zero-sum game. If God has so much love that you can get enough of if you do good, and not enough of if you do that. And the only life that they receive from this God 
is the kind of bloodless satisfaction that you get from correctly solving a math problem. This is the tendency of all institutional religion. Jesus knows this is completely wrong. He knows that in the eyes of the true God, people are not bad. We're just lost to one degree or another, all of us, all the time. The Pharisees show their lostness in their grumbling. And God takes our lostness personally. That's the message of these parables. God will not stand still for it. God will go to any length to bring us home, to bring us back into communion with God and with each other. That's who God is, always. And as Jesus tells it in these parables, the result in our lives, the result of who God is, the practical effect, is joy. Both the man with the lost sheep and the woman with the lost coin call their friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, for I have found what I have lost. So, so the joy is not just for the person who's lost something and found it. It's for everybody around, spectators included. Because joy is that way. It's infinite. Jesus says there will be rejoicing in heaven, rejoicing among the angels of God. Because of who God is, this joy that we can live resounds throughout all creation. So this sounds all great on paper, but does it live out? Well, we have a practical example in today's reading from the first letter to Timothy. Timothy was a co-worker of the Apostle Paul, uh, an assistant who helped him manage and strengthen uh, the churches that Paul had founded all around the eastern Mediterranean. And then at this time, the good news of Jesus Christ was still being passed on uh, almost entirely by word of mouth. There were no Gospels, no New Testament, no creeds, just people talking. And there were different people saying different things about what the truth of Christ was and is. That was one of Paul's main problems, which we hear about all the time in the letters, keeping people on track. Just before the passage we heard today, Paul instructs Timothy to lead people away from the myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. And the aim of this training, he says, is love. That's it. However that, however that love plays out. Love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And then in the reading today, Paul uses himself as an example to demonstrate just what it is that God has done in Jesus Christ. As we heard today, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. And we know this from other parts of the New Testament, mainly the book of Acts. It was Paul's job, back when he was called Saul, to find people who believed in Jesus Christ, to identify them, to finger them, and to punish them, sometimes lethally. Acts tells us that Paul assisted at the execution of Stephen. So Paul certainly had been a persecutor and a man of violence in the service of who he thought God was. But notice that when he confesses these things about himself, the first thing that he says, it's not that he was a persecutor or a man of violence, the first thing he says is that he was a blasphemer. That is, someone who reviles the name of God. Someone who has a perverted understanding of who God is and then thinks and speaks and acts out of that understanding. That's blasphemy. So the wrong understanding, particular to Paul, which this letter talks about, had mostly to do with the law, with the clipboard and pencil. That's the remote God. And it is entirely out of that understanding, that perverted understanding in Paul that understanding of who God is, that the persecution and the violence come from. Now we don't know the specifics of how Paul changed from who he was into who he became. We know it was through his encounter with Jesus Christ. And it is only by the grace of God, the God who Paul now knows is not sitting far off to see if, waiting to see if we're going to satisfy God's requirements, but the God who is here with us now, here with us, and will climb over hill and dale, leaving everything else behind, to find the one who is lost. Only through existence of that God, the God who eternally is, is Paul brought back from persecution and violence, brought home to love, to a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. That's the God who gives us life. And I don't mean just at birth, turning on the key. I mean every minute of 
every day, giving us the power, joyfully, to be who we are. Each one is the beholding of this God, the true God, that stops Paul in his tracks on the final verse of today's read. It, it's almost a mid-thought that this occurs to him. And we can say this way, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen.